Hi, my name is John Downing. I am a limnologist and ecologist. Today I'd like to talk uh, about lake and pond morphometry and uh, that would be including some uh, discussions of origin, form, and ecology. There are things you already know about lake morphometry if you've been around lakes or ponds at all. For example, think about it. Some lakes are big, some are small. This is quite obvious. Some you can see across, some you can't. Lakes are different shapes and forms, and you've probably observed this. There are lakes that are long and skinny, things that are quite have lots of bays and inlets, and other lakes are kind of round. Some lakes are deep and some are shallow. Some are so shallow that you really can't even boat on them. Some of them are very deep um, and um, and stay rather cool in, throughout the wa water column. Some lakes have gradual drop-offs and some precipitous. Probably you figured this out if you've been swimming at all in these lakes or if you fish and uh, are looking for areas where fish, might, um, where fish might live. You'll know that there are different kinds of shores. Sometimes these shores, uh, sometimes lakes will have gradual drop-offs someplace and uh, some places very precipitous drop-offs. And this has kind of a lot to do with the physics of water motion that we'll get to in uh, subsequent sessions. Uh, there are lakes that have islands and some don't. Some are almost all islands uh, with very high insulosity. Some lakes have sandbars and reefs. These are all aspects of lake morphometry that you probably already know something about, but I thought we should uh, talk about them in more depth uh, as we study limnology and aquatic ecology. So the objectives that I have for this particular session is to have us learn about the importance of morphometric measures and then sort of understand how a lake fits into its watershed. Um, and we'll also be walking through sort of lur l um, uh, lake surface morphometric measurements and also some uh, subsurface morphometrics We'll also hopefully learn the essentials of bathymetric maps. And these are tools that you use in recreational boating and fishing and um, in the study of limnological systems. I also want you to understand hypsographic curves. Hypsographic curves are very useful in understanding sort of the volume distribution of aquatic, um, um, aquatic ecosystems. Also, I want you to uh, want us to explore some fluctuations in lake morphometry because these tend to change sometimes over time and then also think a bit about how the origin and form of lakes are uh, related to one another. So first let's start with a, um, uh, some definitions. Uh, morphometry is basically the method of measuring and analyzing the physical dimensions of a lake. Morphometry, measure shape, it's quite simple. A function, of, uh, a function of underwater contour lines, the shape of the lake, and its geologic origin when characterizing or describing a lake is what is really summarized in morphometric data. Morphometric measurements are really important. Some people will say, uh, some limnologists suggest that they're arguably the most basic and fundamental pieces of information that you have on any kind of aquatic system. Why? Well, it's because you need to understand the basin in order to do things like sampling or understand where the inflows and outflows are. You also need to understand if you're a limnologist or interested in fishing or recreation, where different kinds of habitat types are found, where there are sheltered areas, where there are pools, uh, where the slope is high, where the slope is low. These are all important to understanding aquatic ecology of any kind of um, a lentic ecosystem. You absolutely need to have these measurements, the morphometric measurements, if you want to create a budget. A budget is the same as your household budget. What goes in, what goes out, what piles up in your savings account, etc. But we do this in limnology for things like nutrients in order to understand eutrophication, for oxygen and un in order to understand things like fish kills and so on. We also do it for carbon uh, for understanding sort of the place of aquatic systems in um, global change and we also do heat budgets um, also for climatic change reasons but additionally 
to see how a lake changes as a habitat over seasons. Lake morphometric measurements are also very important if we want to predict phenomena, like when a lake will no longer have enough oxygen in it to support life, or when it might have uh, produce algal blooms and so on. According to Bob Wetzel, a very famous historical limnologist, lake morphometry or morphometric measures have important effects on nearly all of the physical, chemical, and biological parameters of lakes. Therefore, very important to understand. And if you're trying to fish a lake and you don't have a morphometric map, you should get busy and um, take our course that we give here in um, a, a lab and field methods in limnology and map that lake yourself. It can be done quite effectively using tools that you may already uh, possess. First thing we should do is talk about the watershed um, again, and we have talked about watersheds and catchments, um, uh, you know, to some degree, but the watershed is the area of land that intercepts drain and drains precipitation and collects water for a particular stream, lake, or other water body. It also is sometimes called a drainage basin and sometimes called a catchment. This is a very important aspect, and lake morphometry is actually simply a remnant or a, or a reflection of the morphometry of the basin in many ways. The United States um, Environmental Protection Agency uh, defines the watershed as an area of land from which all water, sediments, and dissolved materials drain into a common outlet when precipitation occurs um, uh, when precipitation occurs, water runs to the lowest point, usually a stream, river, or lake. On its way to the lowest point, the water crosses over surfaces of forest land, etc., etc. But they summarize, every, everything that happens to a watershed can affect what ends up in the water. I've done a lot of lake restoration work, and uh, basically we never bother restoring the lake per se until the watershed has been restored. It's a fundamental aspect of it, but the lake is a reflection of its watershed chemically, but also physically, and that's the important part of this for today's discussion. The morphometry of lakes is an extension of the hypsometry of the watershed. Hypsometry is a funny kind of word, but that simply means the shapeliness of the watershed. There, And you can see that actually on the right-hand side of this um, um, uh, of this slide, you see the um, uh, the watershed hypsometry or the form of the hypsometry of the watershed of Yellowstone Lake, and then you see Yellowstone Lake um, uh, imposed on it. I think you you can see, except for the big flat place at the bottom of the lake where sediments have built up over time, the morphometry of the watershed is very much like uh, the morphometry of the lake. We are going to talk about various types of measurements that we make. There are vertical measurements, horizontal measurements, and then some synthetic measurements that we put together from these horizontal and vertical measurements. And uh, we'll sort of step through those so that you can um, understand each, one's each type sort of in turn. First off, there are lots of surface measurements that we make on a lake. Um, and these are horizontal measurements. These will include things like the maximum length, obviously, uh, the uh, length from one end to the, the other, the effective length, which is quite different from, uh, from the maximum length, the maximum breadth, the maximum effective breadth, and the direction of major axis. To illustrate, if we are to um, examine the maximum length of this lake, it is from this point up here, to this point down here. The maximum effective length is different. That means the maximum length not crossing across any landforms. Maybe it's from here to here. Uh, maybe it's from here to here. <coughs> it depending, it, we'd have to actually measure it out. Now, likewise for the breadth, the maximum breadth would be across this distance here. But the maximum effective breadth would have to be somewhere in this area or maybe this area, but when measured uh, perpendicularly to the major axis of the lake. 
The direction of the major axis is also quite important, and this you'll begin to understand more when we talk about physical effects. It goes to wind exposure and the amount of work that waves can do on the shore. And so the, um, the direction of maximum, uh, the direc direction of the major axis is quite important, especially when we're thinking about wind direction and um, power. <coughs> Here we have for example, the maximum length of this lake uh, and maximum breadth of this lake. And there we have the maximum effective uh, length and maximum effective breadth of the same lake. Now, wind can exert a great deal of force uh, on lakes. And here you should see a map of um, of the directions, the little arrowheads, which may be difficult for you to see on your screen on this uh, in this video, um, point out the direction of um, the annual prevailing winds. This has a, a large effect on how much work the wind can do at, on um, the shoreline and in sort of mixing the water and so on, but also the annual average wind power. And I apologize to you, uh, those of you from outside the U.S. This is a map, I'm sure for your region, the same kinds of maps exist. Uh, there are sort of basic meteorological data. But here you can see the distribution of wind power um, across this region. And also the previous, um, uh, previous um, image shows the direction. So depending on the orientation of the lake, uh, depending on the orientation of the morphometry of that lake, uh, the um, wind may be able to do more or less uh, work on the, on the lake surface. And therefore, those effective uh, measurements of effective length and breadth and orientation um, uh, uh, are very important for understanding physics, which we'll discuss in a subsequent session. Now, um, the way this works, of course, is and probably one of the most important variables we measure is something called the effective fetch. This is dependent on wind direction, and wave height will vary with fetch. And um, basically, the effective fetch is the distance across the lake that, uh, to a, a given point um, uh, where wind can work unimpeded. And usually, we measure this to a, a variety of different uh, bearings off of this um, single point, um, so off the central radial, which gives us an idea of where the wind um, when the wind is coming that direction, how much work it's going to be able to do on this particular point. These uh, we'll elaborate more on as we talk about physics. There are lots of surface morphometric measurements. There's the uh, shoreline length, which is L sub uh, zero, the contour length, which is um, a little, sorry, the shoreline length is I uh, sub zero, the contour length is little L sub I, and the contour, contours are areas of equal depth that we'll see in a moment. We also are very interested in the area of a lake, the total area, um, total area of, of occupied by a lake, as well as the lacustrine area, which is little a. This is uh, important because we um, uh, distinguish uh, the water area from the overall area uh, encompassed by the circumference of the lake. A sub i is total island area. And therefore, we can calculate something called the insulosity, i sub n, as the ratio of island area to the area of the um, uh, total area of the lake. This is rarely greater than about 30% or 0.3. Um, once it gets to be about 0.3 for the insulosity, people begin to call the lakes different lakes and divide up the open water into a variety of different um, uh, different lakes or different lake basins. There is a single lake around Minneapolis, Minnesota that has 18 or so separate basins, or one could uh, one does consider it simply one lake with 18 different basins divided up by points um, points and various islands. Now let's move to subsurface morphometrics, which are 
important also. And this will include vertical measurements, of course. And um, these will be measurements of depth. And we do this normally now using sonar of varying kinds. In the past, it was done with a lead line. There's nothing wrong with a lead line as long as you operate it well. Um, uh, there's a history, actually, of operating these things that um, leads to some very odd sorts of numbers and depth maps that if you use water absorbing line uh, for your for your hand line for measuring depth at, at a certain point a certain depth you no longer can tell that there's a weight on the end because the rope itself feels um, very heavy due to the amount of water absorbed by it so often you find on um, depth maps or well, occasionally you find on depth maps now not so much anymore um, but you'll find uh, measurements that were essentially infinite. And this is kind of where some of the uh, local legends uh, of bottomless lakes come from or lakes being attached to the sea in some sort of way because they put down a hand line and they simply cannot find the bottom. It's basically the hand line is giving you faulty reason, uh, faulty measurements. Um, sonar is, is preferred, although sonar should really be calibrated and very few people do this. Um, uh, compare them to an actual calibration curve. Sometimes they're right and sometimes they're not. Another thing that we measure as a sort of a subsurface morphometric measurement is, not, um, is the bottom slope. Slope is really important for understanding the function of aquatic systems, especially the kind of substrate that you find on the bottom. This actually shows the graph of, of the slope here, uh, of the bottom slope of a lake versus the water content of the sediment on the bottom. What you can see is when the bottom is relatively flat, the sediment is fairly full of water, uh, but when the slope is high, that um, sediment sloughs off, the high water content sediment sloughs off, goes down to deeper water, and gives a much lower water content uh, in the, when the slope is quite high. Over on the right-hand side, you see a morphometric map of a, of a lake that I know quite well. And um, the different colors show the different depths in this lake. And if you took the, I just by eye, you can see places where um, slope is changing really rapidly, or depth is changing rapidly, that is a high slope, and other places where depth is changing very slowly. Slope can be very important ecologically because it drives the kind of habitat um, that is um, there. The next measurement I'd like to talk about that we uh, measure on lakes, and this is one of the really important sort of measurements you carry around with you on these systems, and that's the mean depth or average depth. Now mean depth is really simple. It's only dividing the volume by the area, and it's essentially equivalent to um, squeezing that, uh, volu that um, volume of water into a lake that's the same depth everywhere. That's really all it does. So mean depth is the depth that a lake would be if a lake of the same volume and surface area had the same depth every place. But it simply is derived by dividing the volume by the area. Um, and the volume will be in something like um, cubic meters and the area will be in square meters. You divide cubic meters by square meters and you get meters and that would be the mean depth. It's a very uh, useful measure um, uh, because it tells you something about the overall um, vol uh, depth of that system. And there are lakes, in fact, that have really great, really high maximum depth, but have a fairly um, low mean depths. Um, here we have the, uh, uh, another graph from the CALF textbook on limnology that shows here's the mean depth for a bunch of different lakes and the, a productivity indicator set of lines. One is total phosphorus, another is chlorophyll A, another is uh, commercial fish catch. And what this means is, what you can understand from this is, is productivity in those shallow lakes, those with very low mean depth, tends to be pretty high compared to those that are very, very deep. Um, and this is uh, one of the reasons that we like to um, keep, um, uh, keep mindful of what the mean depth of any system might be. Also, um, there are other calculations you can make or approximations you can make from the mean depth. Here's a, a graph that shows mean depth on the x-axis and flushing rate on the y-axis. This is a logarithmic scale. 
And basically, as mean depth increases, the flushing rate de decreases. Um, basically, lakes are too deep over here to flush very rapidly. Now, there is quite a bit of variation around it, so you're far better off measuring the flushing rate if you want to run a budget on a lake. But it does give you some sense, really, of how that lake works. Well, so how do you calculate the volume? And it's pretty easy. What you do is you basically slice the lake up into a bunch of strata and um, uh, of, a, of a given height, and you uh, approximate the volume of each stratum um, uh, by uh, some sort of rectangle, rectangular measurement and then add them all up together. It's quite straightforward to do. All it takes a little bit of calculation. Another estimate or, or another measurement that's uh, a morphometric measurement that's important is the shoreline development. You have probably noticed, as I pointed out really early in this little talk, that um, you already know that there's some lakes that have sort of meandering shores that have a lot of bays and so on. And then there are other lakes that are kind of round. Um, I tend to like the meandered shores myself, but it, it's a matter of taste. But we measure that uh, sort of shapeliness or shapefulness of a system by um, a measure called the shoreline development. This has nothing to do with how many lake, uh, lake cottages are built on it or anything like that. Not that kind of development. This is how much the shoreline is wiggly or for given a certain um, uh, a certain area, a certain size of the lake. So the shoreline development. Um, uh, equation is d sub l is equal to the shoreline length divided by 2 times the square root of the area times pi. Um, and this has a maximum, a minimum value of 1, and it can become quite large with very meandered shores, as we'll see in just a little bit. You can prove this minimal measurement for yourself by simply saying, uh, understanding that a circle has a minimum shoreline length for a given area and then substituting 2 pi r for l and pi r squared for a in the equation and then solving it and you'll find that uh, d sub l for a circle has to equal 1. This is the shoreline of a lake compared to the shoreline it would have if it were a perfect circle with the same area. So a, a, a d sub l of 10 has 10 times as much um, 10 times as much shore per unit area than you would expect uh, than you would expect if it were a perfect circle. Now there's also a shore index and this is also elaborated on in the uh, limnology textbook by Jakob Kalf and basically there's if you calculate a shore index this is kilometers of shore per square kilometer of water area a very similar kind of measurement and then relate this to things like waterfowl biomass or other measurements, you'll find that those with very high, um, very high uh, shore indices tend to have high productivity or high abundance of wildlife. It's probably because of the habitat complexity um, and the amount of shelter and a variety of other factors related to shoreline length. Uh, but the shore index is, can be uh, useful uh, in understanding um, the productivity of aquatic ecosystems. The next um, measurement, the morphometric measurement I'd like to talk about is the development of volume. And this uh, is an index that compares the volume of a lake to the volume it would have if it were a perfect cone with its height equal to the maximum depth. Um, so you can see that on the, uh, uh, the right hand side, what, uh, what I mean by this. Um, now the the development of volume is uh, this index is uh, based on the idea that the volume of a cone is one third the basal area times the height, and so um, it basically is uh, development of volume is three times the mean depth divided by the maximum depth will tell you how much development of volume uh, there is. There's also a depth ratio that is sometimes uh, useful or interesting, and this is the ratio of the mean depth to the maximum depth. Now, clearly, if there is a great big deep hole in the uh, in a lake, then the ratio is going to be very um, small. If the uh, 
if the uh, uh, if the lake were shaped like a box with a side straight up right up and down and a flat bottom then the ratio would be equal to one um, and that would be the maximum kind of um, value you could have for the depth ratio um, so lakes can have identical surface areas and volumes but they can have very different kinds of shapes um, and this is characterized by the depth uh, rate uh, the depth ratio and um, you can see here for the sinusoidal and hyperboloid sorts of lake shapes they have a fairly low um, a, a depth ratio so what this means is the mean depth is about a third the maximum depth ellipsoid or par uh, paraboloid um, uh, lake shapes tend to have higher depth ratios and as I said um, a um, essentially a uh, rectangle would um, have the maximum possible depth ratio so if you find a lake with a very high depth ratio chances are are very good that it has very steep sides now lakes have very different basin forms and um, I realize I haven't shown you yet how lake maps are are constructed but I will do that in just a second <clears throat> but these are contour lines of some kind of imaginary um, uh, imaginary um, lake and the contour line shows the depth at which uh, shows areas of equal depth and so one thing to remember and and they always have a contour interval but they're supposed to always have an equal contour interval for example then um, this may be the zero contour which most certainly is this might be the one meter two meter three meter four meter five meter and so on contours the contour interval the the depth difference between um, contour lines is always supposed to stay um, very uh, is supposed to stay constant so what you can see from this one is that um, uh, you have an equal equally spaced contour lines and this is uh, pretty much a sort of straight sort of line this these contour lines look kind of like a ball don't they um, so um, as such as you might expect from drawing um, uh, contour lines on a ball and um, so that has sort of a basin or bowl shaped um, uh, bowl shaped contour of the bottom and this one um, has very steep sides and a very flat bottom and so you'd expect it to look kind of like we saw Lake Tahoe um, was looking a Graben type lake with very steep sides and a very flat bottom now here I've shown you um, uh, I'm showing you what kinds of map uh, essentials there are on a map um, and um, uh, basically what you can see here is the sort of form of a map um, and uh, and uh, these are contour lines and in this case the contour lines are oh, 10 feet I think apart um, so what you can see here is wherever those contour lines are packed together um, very uh, densely then that's where the slope of the bottom is greatest and where they are uh, packed together very sparsely such as this area over here the bottom is really flat and these are um, often um, just simply um, uh, marked with a depth interval now this is what you'll see usually on a kind of a sonar um, um, sonar device and um, more and more we simply see these electronically rather than carrying a chart around with us but most limnologists um, learn to actually read uh, morphometric maps and I'll um, uh, get that uh, showing for you in just a second if I haven't um, if it doesn't uh, sh um, if it doesn't come up automatically I'll show you kind of a standard sort of morphometric map on these things you'll see landforms you'll see all kinds of things here are the coordinates of this point here a sort of a waypoint you can measure distances that um, this is maybe distance made good you can see also the bearing um, uh, calendar bearing and so on um, you get a lot of data on a sonar um, sonar device these days that has built-in um, charts and bathymetric maps now here are map essentials and this would be on a sort of standard paper map although we don't use them on paper terribly much but a standard sort of bathymetric map 
or depth map of a lake will have a variety of different kinds of major features indicated on them. First, they have the shore that's indicated. They'll often t have some kind of scale bar, such as this one, although in this case the scale bar is not indicated um, um, in, uh, in how long that scale actually is. Uh, I believe it's a kilometer in this particular map. Um, uh, so that uh, horizontal scale in meters is usually shown. Here we have uh, the uh, overall scale, so now I know that that scale is running from 800 meters to 1300 meters, so it's half a kilometer actually. This is a half kilometer bar. You'll see the contour lines on this map, and these will tell you what the depth is. The, here the depth is indicated in meters on this particular lake, and don't forget that any place those lines are tightly packed together is a, a high slope area. Big areas like this would indicate some kind of flat area. This, of course, is very shallow and very flat over in this area. So those contour lines are quite important. Usually there is some kind of coordinate system indicated on any map you'll get. Obviously on your sonar, if you have built-in maps, it'll be obvious there from the GPS marker. Um, but in this case, this plus, my, uh, plus mark indicates 47 degrees uh, 24 minutes north and 93 uh, degrees 31 minutes west um, of Greenwich. And um, uh, so that is, tells you what the position is. Other things you find there are um, sort of geographic orientation. Here's a northerly marker here. Uh, you'll also see um, a statement of the contour interval somewhere various inlets and outlets and inflows and outflows. Here's an inflow of water, inflow of water, and an outflow of water. Um, and if, um, if you're a limnologist in doing this, you'll usually have sampling sites marked as are marked here. And then usually they'll have the name of the makers of the map and date. And date can be important because these um, the lake maps change over time. In fact, um, in, in uh, recently we found for a series of lake um, bathymetric maps that they had changed really radically uh, over time due to sedimentation and shore processes. Other things that you'll find on maps will be prominent terrestrial features and this is particular tr particularly true on electronic maps on your sort of GPS or um, sonar device. They'll show reefs, shoals, and various navigation hazards, beacons, lights, and navigation buoys, and these are very important, especially if you're trying to navigate at night. Names of bays, of islands, important shore areas, um, uh, other characteristics oftentimes now such as sediments and vegetation, the kinds of structure that you find. And these are uh, often included on maps that are meant for fishing or other kinds of water recreation. And also some summary of morph morphometric data. Things like the mean depth, the maximum depth, the area, the volume, those things that limnologists need in order to make really good estimates of and, and measurements on these uh, aquatic systems. The next thing I'd like to talk about are hypsographic curves. And these are really simple things, um, but they seem really complicated. And I'll start out by telling you what they, how they're structured and what they mean in general. So hypsographic um, it has to do with the bottom form. Hypsographic also refers to um, the um, uh, terrestrial area can also have a hypsography. What this tells you is basically how much of a given area area that you're discussing is found at various depths. Okay, so here we have the relative area. Oh, and we could just call this area in in square kilometers or something. It, here it says percent, but we put these as percentages only so that we can put different lakes of different sizes on the same graph. Okay, but this could be the area in hundreds of kilometers, uh, in, in kilometers square kilometers I mean and this could, it could be let's say this is depth in meters so from 0 to 100 meters and from 0 to 100 square kilometers now what this means is for various curves and you see a whole bunch of different hypsographic curves here for various curves you can read off of these some important variables so um, if uh, so basically uh, we can say okay um, uh, about tw um, if we're interested in how much of a lake 
is below uh, 20, uh, 20 meters, we simply can read across here to this f minus 3 plot and say, okay, 20 meters, read down here, and we say we get to about, oh, let's say 7 or 8 percent, or 7 or 8 square kilometers, whichever you'd like. So we can say that in this case, uh, um, 7 or 8 percent of the lake is deeper than about 20 meters or 20 percent of the total depth, whichever we, uh, whichever variables we have plotted here. And that would be for a very convex sort of hypsographic curve. And if you want to know what these things really mean, just look at them as sort of your average shoreline. You're standing up here on the beach and you're walking out to the middle of the lake somehow. Um, in th with this F minus 3 um, uh, a hypsographic curve, you're going a very, very, very long way out <coughs> before you get to any deep water. Whereas um, with F3, uh, this is be a lake like Tahoe with those very steep sides. You are basically falling off a cliff when you jump off the side. So that's what all these hypsographic curves really mean. Now in practice, a lot of the lakes of the world sort of fall uh, in this and this region and up, but we'll look at a few of those in a minute. So we do talk about uh, different terms like concave and convex um, uh, hypsographic curves and bottom profiles. This would be the concave, this would be the convex bottom uh, profile. And you can read these and we'll go over that again with an actual hypsographic curve in just a second <coughs> so that you can see again how how we use these curves. They're very useful as you can imagine if we're doing calculations of the amount of anaerobic area or area without any oxygen or the amount of uh, the volume of the hypolimnion. It's very helpful to have um, uh, uh, graphs like this. Um, they, so in general as you look at hypsographic curves as long as they're in this kind of format they will uh, sort of echo the overall bottom form as you walk out from the upper right hand corner to the uh, middle of a lake at the um, upper left hand corner you'll see what kind of bottom form you have. These can be of course as I mentioned earlier in relative like percentage of total uh, maximum depth and area or absolute in meters and square meters or something like that. Here are a bunch of hypsographic curves again um, hypsographic curves for uh, the Great Lakes and some other large lakes. It gives you a, a sense of where these lakes um, uh, are situated on the uh, on the hypsographic curve. Again we've got here cumulative depth and percent and this is percent of maximum and cumulative area as a percent of the total area. Um, lakes like Erie for example have very steep shores right and then a gradual decline and then some very deep places. Uh, a lake like Malern, this one number 10, um, has a fairly gradual uh, slope down to a very deep, uh, to its very deepest um, points. A hypsographic curves vary substantially among different, different aquatic systems. Now here's a hypsographic curve that, that I have made on one of the 170 or so lakes that I study in, in that region. Um, this is a hypsography of West Okoboji Lake in Iowa and these are data that we've derived um, from um, mapping exercises and, um, and also uh, geographical information systems uh, analyses of, um, of a whole bunch of different lakes. And here we see the cumulative percent below uh, a, a given depth and here we have a, a combination kind of hypsographic curve. Here we have depth in, in meters and percent, uh, percent of actual area just to make it a little bit easier to use. And here we can just um, use this graph pretty easily. For example, if we just read down, this is in a different position than the one I showed you a little bit ago, read down from that point uh, on the graph down to the axis, you're, you're s describing, of course, about 70% of the area here and about 5 meters here. And so those estimates, 70% and 5 meters, can be read 70% of the area is deeper 
than five meters. Let's do another one. Here's an, uh, here, here we read down here from this other point, deeper down in the lake, and we get 20%, 20 meters. 20% of the area is deeper than 20 meters. These are very easy to uh, use uh, if you bear those um, uh, rules in mind and extremely useful in understanding how lake ecosystems work. Now, lake origins um, determine in a, a large degree their uh, morphometry. There are circular uh, lakes, uh, obviously. Lakes, and these would be crater lakes, uh, caldera, some of the perfect doline solution pit lakes that you get from dissolution of um, limestone. Some of the meteoric basins, if you remember that reservoir that um, I showed you in an uh, earlier talk, and deflation basins, which are um, areas of sand that are relatively round. They will have development development ratios of, and you remember, 1.0 is a circle, and those uh, d sub l uh, variable values will range from 1.04 to 1.15. So those would be pretty circular kinds of lakes. Now, subcircular lakes would be things like cirque lakes that are um, uh, up at the top of uh, uh, glacial, montane glaciers. Glacier, yeah, up at the top of montane glaciers. Some kettle lakes, um, lakes formed by various shore processes in unconsolidated substrate like those shore uh, lakes. They tend to be subcircular and they'll have a slightly higher d sub l. And then um, elliptical lakes like the Carolina Bays, which you see there on the right hand side, uh, some of the oriented Arctic lakes that you see, you can see on Google Earth, will be formed like ellipses, and those will have higher uh, d sub l values. Looking at a couple of other kinds here, the, the some of the lakes, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, like uh, Lake Tahoe, the Graben uh, lakes, are subrectangular elongate, meaning that they have very steep sides and sort of rectangularly shaped. Um, and we'll find those in sort of morainic dam lakes uh, and grabens. And they'll have a higher development rate. So they'll have about two and a half um, times the, uh, two and a half to five times the shoreline they should have if they were a perfect circle of the same area. Um, dendritic lakes, like the um, flooded uh, valley lakes, you see this is Woahink Lake in Oregon over on the right, right hand side, or almost any new impoundment will be quite den dendritic and they'll have very very high decibel values maybe uh, you know as high as 50 or so depending on how dendritic they are um, and the final slide we have on that would be thinking about lunate sorts of oxbow lakes they will have a high decibel value uh, drowned valley lakes uh, behind bars lateral lakes in mature valleys also will have fairly high d sub l um, values and sort of irregular basins such as fusion fusion of various basins together um, uh, glacial scour lakes and so on will have d sub l values in the one and a half to two times 2.5 uh, range which means they have one and a half to two and a half times as much shore as they should have for that given area were it a perfect circle there are also some substantial fluctuations in lake morphometry that are pretty important. Um, and this can include, well, closed lakes in arid regions where you really, uh, where um, rainfall is sporadic. They may, uh, they may change uh, substantially in area air over time, covered, covered over time, area and depth, both covered over time. And also lakes with very broad shallow littoral zones. It would take a very small, a um, um, small fluctuation in depth of that water to change the area quite a lot. And of course, um, sometimes uh, input water is diverted away from lakes. And in one of these cases, the Aral Sea, for example, has lost something like 60%, well, it's actually more than that now, uh, of it, it's lost 60 to 80% of its area in the last 30 years due to agricultural diversion into uh, two various rivers. So we can see some of that. Here's the Aral Sea, and you can see the shrinkage of the Aral Sea from top to bottom from 1973 to 2000. It's even worse now. Um, great shrinkage, 
it was one of the uh, um, it was the world's fourth largest lake in 1960 and ha has been shrinking because of it's a fairly arid region and uh, water's been diverted for agriculture so the lake resource is essentially disappearing and that that's left behind is of course extremely salty indeed also lake chad has been shrinking and this is in the sahara and it's losing uh uh it's changed in area from 25,000 square kilometers in 1963 to about 1500 square kilometers presently and this this is due to drier climate and a growing demand for water again in the region and um, its primary source of water is monsoon rains but a lot of that is now diverted for agricultural reasons to summarize then from this session um, morphometry is really important um, and it's important for understanding habitat and budgets and function and modeling and pretty much everything we do with limnology. It's among the most important data we can possess. Morphometric measurements can be direct or synthetic, and we, we've seen some of those. Some of the direct measurements would be depth and area and so on. Synthetic measurements would be things like bottom slope and um, um, development, uh, uh, shoreline development, and so on. I hope you've also learned some of the uh, characteristics of maps and the concept of contour interval and bottom slope. Um, some of so these maps, both electronic and paper maps, contain basic elements that help in understanding lake form and function. Hypsometry is a study that tells us about basic water body shape, and this can be used in um, calculating various volumes affected by um, uh, various aspects of an ecosystem. So hypsom hypsometry is an important kind of synthetic measurement that we make on aquatic systems and hypsometry is again uh, some, somewhat of a reflection of the landscape in which the lake exists. Also to remember that lake morphometry is strongly related to origin. Different kinds of lakes have different kinds of lake morphometry, and um, this is important to remember when you're studying diverse uh, lake ecosystems. And also, don't forget that morphometry can change substantially over time via drying, diversion of water, um, and various other changes to the, um, to the landscape and to the um, actual basin form of the lake itself.